Hello, everybody. We're going to move to another topic, which is state-based representation for discrete time systems. So in continuous time systems, given a transfer function, we can represent, we can express the system in as a state space. So from our lecture on continuous time, we know that x dot is equal to in state space form, we know that x dot so x dot is equal to ax plus bu then y is equal to cx is equal to cx so this is in continuous time this is for continuous time systems but now we want to express any discrete time system in state space form so now we are working in discrete time domain and you already know that things are slightly different in the discrete time domain so i'm going to illustrate how to represent um, discrete time systems in state space in state space form so giving a transfer function g of z so I'm going to use an example. So if g of z is equal to this, so this is a transfer function, and we want to represent this system in state space using states uh, in state space form as um, in this form. But this is a continuous time. In continuous time, it's in form of derivative. You have derivatives. So x dot is the x dt, the but in discrete time, there's you don't have the concept of derivative. You make use of difference equation. So in discrete time, so this one the above is in continuous time. So in discrete time system, this is the representation. You have x then k plus 1 t is equal to a x k s k t then b u k t then y of k t is equal to cx of kt so this is the way we want to represent it in discrete time in continuous time you have derivatives but in continuous time you have derivatives x dot but in discrete time you have the notion of the next state so where k is an integer number because in discrete time you are dealing with integer multiples of the of the period so k is always an integer so given a discrete time system we want to be able to express it in state space form which is given by this so we are going to be using an example uh in order we we'll solve it with an example so from this example like any transfer function we should be able to convert it into a uh, state space in discrete time so we have this transfer function here and we are in, we are in the z domain so we're in the discrete time domain so there are many methods of converting it in, in state space but we'll look at the direct programming method so subsequently in other lectures we'll look at other methods so for this class this is the method we are going to be using so the first step there are different steps um then there are different steps you have to do so the first step the number one step is to this is the original transfer function here so the first step is to divide both sides of the transfer function by the highest power of z that is the first step so if you look at this transfer function here 
the highest power of z is z squared because this is the transfer function you are giving but the denominator this denominator a is z minus one squared so if you expanded if we had expanded our base we are going to arrive at so the expansion of this is simply z squared is z squared minus 2z plus 1. So this is the expansion. So the first step is to divide both sides of the numerator and denominator by the highest power of z. So the highest power of z is z squared. So the first step now is we are going to divide the transfer function. You divide this one by z squared and you divide the denominator by z squared because the highest power of z is z squared. So that is the first step. So we are dividing the numerator and the denominator by z squared. And when you expand out this, you are going to arrive at this. And after that, you are going to um, make it a little bit more compact. So z divided by z squared is z raised to the power minus 1. Then 1 divided by z squared is z raised to the power minus 2. Similarly, z squared divided by z squared is 1. Minus 2z divided by z squared is minus 2z raised to the power 1. Then 1 divided by z squared is um, z minus 2. So we are just making it compact in this step. Then the second step, which is very important, is to introduce a dummy variable. So you're going to introduce a dummy variable, E of Z, where E of Z is the error signal. So you know, we know that y, y of Z is the output, U of Z is the input, is the control input. So we are defining a, a an intermediate variable or a dummy variable called e of z and e of z represents the error and you are defining it such that when you this is the transfer function you're giving so when you introduce this dummy variable and you do this arithmetic you are going to arrive at um y divided by u so y of z of z divided by a of z multiplied by a of z divided by u of z is going to give you y of z divided by u of z. So you are introducing this dummy variable such that when this and uh, when you do this uh, operation, you arrive at the original transfer function. So that's the next step. And after introducing that, you are going to separate out. The next step is to separate out this transfer function because We've broken down this transfer function into two now. The reason why we are introducing this dummy variable is that we want to simplify it, we want to break down the original transfer function that is given to us in the question. So we that's why we introduced the the, the intermediate variable. Now you have two equations. So the next step is to separate out this particular question you are giving into those two equations. So we said that we separated it out into these two. So this multiplied by this. So don't worry about how you have to separate it. There, there are different ways of separating it. This is not only the only combination to separate it. You might, there's a question. How do we, do we need to write our metric? No, no, there's no need. There's no need to, there's no need to write your matrix number. So this the, is going to be available on module. The recording is going to be available on module. So no need to, no need to, to write your matrix number. So I already have it. So far you attended the meeting. I already have the, a log of those that attended the meeting on my system. So the log will be available to me. So there's no need of 
of writing your your matric number because I already know the people that are present. Okay, so we okay we are going to separate out. Like I said, the first step I said is to divide both sides of the equations by uh, the highest power of z, which is z squared. So the next step is to is to introduce this dummy variable such that when you when you do this, you are going to arrive at the original transfer function. So we are breaking this, the original, this is the original transfer function. We are breaking it down into two, which is given by this and this. So when you multiply both of these together, we are going to arrive at the original transfer function. So the method of separation is going to be given to you because there are other ways you can break it down. The, the first one may be 0 0.00125 times um, this, then this will just be one divided by this. So the, the, the way to break it down is going to be given to you so that you would have a uniform way of breaking it down. So don't worry about how to break it down. So you'll be told that y of z divided by a of z is this, then a of z divided by a of z is this. So now we've broken it down. So we know that uh, y divided by a of z is this, then e of z divided by e of z is this. So if we, after breaking it down, the next step is to cross multiply. So when you cross multiply this equation, we are going to arrive at this. So yeah, we just simply expanded it out. The next step is to cross multiply this equation. So when you cross multiply it, we are going to arrive at this. Then when we try to want to the this the next step after this point is to make y of z the subject of formula for the first equation and to make e of z uh, on the on the left hand side for the second equation so yeah we made y of z, z on the right hand side we separated y of z for the first equation now i want to separate e of z in the second equation so after cross multiplying in this step, then you expand it out, then you separate out E of Z. So we've made Y of Z and E of Z the subject of formula. So we are almost done. Now we've gotten to this step. So after separating it out, you would make, after separating the original transfer function into two, the next step is to make Y of Z, then E of Z, on the left hand side so we've uh, we've achieved that then the third um the fourth step is to construct a block diagram of these two equations so the, i'm going to be starting with the first equation then after that i would add the this second equation so in order to represent this equation in block diagram we are going to so you know that in control systems, first of all, you start with U of Z, which is a control input. Then you have a summing block or a comparator, which will give you the error. Then you know that the last, the last part is the output. So you first of all have this. Then, then, then you know that, so this is, this is the equation for Y of Z in the question. So Z raised power minus one multiplied by E of Z plus Z raised power minus two multiplied by E of Z. So you have the, this E of Z here. Then E of Z, then this block is Z minus one. So multiplying E of Z by Z minus one, we give you Z minus one E of Z. So you already have this. So you have the error signal E of Z here. Then when this E of Z is multiplied by Z minus one, so there is going to be a block here, Z minus one. So it gives you, z minus one e of z so the, we already have this then you need this z raised power minus two multiplied by e of z so this particular z minus one e of z if you multiply it by z minus one you're going to get z raised power minus two e of z so you just need to put a z minus one block here in order to get z 
base power minus 2a of z. So we've gotten all we need. We've gotten z minus 1, and we've gotten z minus 2 raised, um, multiplied by here z. Then we need to add it together. So you introduce a summing block. So when you add, so you bring out the this block, which is z minus 1, a of z. You bring it out here to add it. Then z minus 2, a of z. You bring it out here to add it to give you y of z. So this particular, uh, this particular equation, this is a block diagram that represents it. So first of all, you start with your control input and the error signal. Then you know that your output is on the right hand side. Then you introduce this block. If to say this, this here was z raised to power minus two, and this was z raised to power minus three. So this block here is going to be z minus two, and here is going to be z minus one. So it's just this block and this block that is going to is going to change based on the equation you have here. Then the next step is to include the second equation into the block diagram. In order to include the, so we already have this one. So this one was the first equation where my cousin is. Now I want to include the second equation into the block diagram. So we have E of Z is equal to this three summation. So this is the E of Z, which is the output, is equal to three summation. So the first summation is this, 0 0.00125 multiplied by E of Z. So U of Z is A. So you introduce this block, 0 0.00125, such that when this and this is multiplied together, you would have 0 0.00125 U of Z. So we've gotten this one. The next step is to get this. And in order to get this, we are going to, you know, this comprises of Z minus one A of Z. And we already have Z minus one A of Z. So all we need to do is just multiply it by two and add it here. That will give us the, uh, the error signal. So we just bring out this Z minus one A of Z. Then you multiply by two. So there's a minus two here because yeah, there's a minus here. So minus times minus is plus. So you eventually get this plus. Then the third summation is Z minus two is zero to power minus two e of z. We already have z minus two e of z here. So we just bring it out here, then add it together. So we add it the first term here, which is this one where my cousin is. You had the second term, which is this point here, then the third term, which is coming out from this place. So we've been able to construct a block diagram of this system. Now, the final step, um, not the final step, uh, the second to the last step is to represent these two equations. Uh, we have these two equations, we've represented it in block diagram form. So the final step is to express these two equations in terms of the states of the system. Why did the summation point change? Okay. Okay, the summation point, it's changed because, okay, we have for the first equation, this is the first summation point and this is the second summation point. Then for the second equation, it, it, didn't, it didn't change. It's just that for this second equation, we needed to multiply u of z by this factor. So it didn't change. It's just that in between u of z and this summation block, I just put in this factor a 0 0.00125 because we needed to multiply u of z by 0 0.00125. That was all I did. I just introduced this block here. So in the middle between this point and this summation, I just introduced a block here because of this equation we have. So it didn't change. It's just that there was an introduction of another block. So the, the second to the last step is to represent these two equations 
in terms of the states. Remember, we're in, in state space. The major objective is for us to represent the system in state space. So the next step is to represent these two equations in terms of the states x1 and x2. So uh, in the question, you'll be told the states of the system. So x2 is given by 0 raised to the power minus 1 a of z, y x1 is given by 0 raised to the power minus 2 a of z. So you'll be given the states of the system. And these are the states of the system. You have x1 here and you have x2. So if you look at the block diagram, x1 is z raised to the power minus 2 e of z, and this is z raised to the power minus 2 e of z. So this is x1. Then x2 is z raised to the power minus 1 e of z. So this is x2 here. So you'll be given the states of the system, and these are the states of the system. So the second, um, the second to the last step is to represent these two equations in terms of e of the state. So we don't want to, we don't want to be, we don't want this e of z. We don't want this e of z. We want to represent it in terms of x one and x two, which are the states of the system. So in order to do that, we have to find the relationship between. Um, because for these two equations, we have e of z, and we don't want that. We want it to be in terms of x1 and x2, which are the states of the system. So we need to find the relationship between e of z and x1, and e of z and x2. So this is, you're already given this, so your, your problem is even almost solved, because you already know the relationship between x2 and e of z, and you know the relationship between x1 and e of z. So um, now you need the relationship between uh, x1 and x2. So since x1 is this and x2 is this, you can simply find the relationship. So z minus 1 multiplied by x2 is simply x1. So from the block diagram, this is x2. So if you multiply z minus 1 times x2, you are simply going to get x1. So this is the relationship. And therefore, from this block, you know that uh, e of z is equal to z multiplied by x2. So when you multiply both sides by z, you multiply this by z, and you multiply z, this by z, you just get your e of z. So the reason why we are doing this is just to make it can we switch the positions of x1 and x2? Okay, that is a good question. The, the answer is that you're going to be given the question, like you're going to be told that this is equal to x2 and this is equal to x1. So the question could change that let this be x1 and let this be x2. But for this particular question, we are saying that let z raised to the power minus 1 e of z be x2 and z raised to the power minus 2 e of z be x1. So you'll be given in the question and it can be anything actually. It can be, this one can be x1, this one can be x2, it can be anything. But for this particular question, this is what it, it is. So we need to, to follow it. So after that, we already know the relationship between A of Z and X2 because the fundamental aim is to express these two equations in terms of the states X1 and X2. So now, since we've, we've done, these are the two equations now. So we know that the relationship between X1 and X2 is given by this. Then we are expressing E of Z. So now we are on the on the sec second equation, instead of e of z, we write z x2, so z x2. So u of z is still the same thing. Then this, in place of, in place of z minus one e of z, we write x2, because we know that z minus one e of z, from the question, we know that z minus one e of z is x2. So in place of this, we just write x2. So here is the x2 here. 
here's the x2. Then for this, z equals to the power minus 2e of z is x1. So we just write x1 here. Then for this equation, y of z is equal to z minus 1 e of z. So we know that z is power minus 1 e of z is x2. Because we are given in the question, and we know that z is power minus 2 e of z is x1. So you have x1 here. So now we are, how did we get the relationship between x1 and x2? Okay. The, the way we got the relationship, first of all, you'll be giving this, you'll be, you'll be giving that x2 is this and x1 is this. Then the way we got the relationship is that this is x2 and this is x1. So in order to get x1, you multiply z minus 1 multiplied by x2 is x1. So this block, z minus 1 times x2, will give you x1. And so that's what I simply did here. So z minus 1 multiplied by x2, we give you x1. Just from looking at the block diagram, you would know the relationship. Then when you multiply both sides by z, when you multiply both sides of this equation by z, you are going to arrive at this equation here. So it's from the block diagram. So you have x2 here and you have x1 here. So the relationship is just this z minus 1. So z minus 1 multiplied by x2 is give, we, we give you x1, which I wrote here. Then when you multiply both sides of this equation by z, you arrive at this. Then for the relationship between e of z and x2, you already have this, which is given in the question. Then when you multiply both sides by z, you're going to arrive at this equation. So that's why how we got the relationship. So the, the reason why we need this relationship is that in place of these equations, we want to represent it in terms of the states of the system, which is x1 and x2, and we've achieved that. And the next step is to convert into the time domain. Now, because in state space form, you're actually in the time domain, you're not in the z domain. So it's, we've done conversion from the z domain into the discrete time domain. And the conversion is pretty much easy. So when z is mut uh, multiplied by uh, any, any constant in the z domain, the equivalent form is when you're converting into the time domain, you have k plus one. So here is just uh, x to k of t. Because, because of this z here, you have the k plus one here. But because there's no z here, you have just k t. So if, let me just try to explain it better. So if we want to convert, if you have something like this, and this is z raised to power two, and this is um, z raised to power two, so z raised to power minus one. If you want to convert this into the time domain, this one is going to become, it's going to become what? So we want to convert, if to say you have a z here. So this z is just simply z raised to power one. So the conversion to, to the sign domain is simply k plus one times t. But if you have z minus one, so here's just going to be minus. So that's why you do it. So if it is z minus two, the conversion to the time domain is two. So if this is z minus three, and you're converting to the time domain is three here. Then if this one was plus, if there's a plus here, when you're converting to the time domain, it's just going to be plus. So that's how to convert from the z domain to the time domain. So taking account all I've just said, the, the conversion of, of these three equations, which are in the z domain, into the time domain is given by these three equations. So I just simply converted from the z domain 
into the time domain. Then the final step is to represent it in state space form. So this is the state space form in discrete time domain. So you have your x a x is equal to a x plus b u, then y is equal to c x. So we know that x k plus one is simply a matrix form because we have two states in this question. So I'm breaking it in matrix form. This is x1, uh, x2, k plus 1. Y x of kt is given by this. So I want to express this in state space form. And this is the state space form. So this is x, k plus 1 is equal to a x plus b u. So now I'm representing it in matrix form because we have two states, which is x1 and x2. Then y is equal to cx. So we need this, uh, this matrix. We need this matrix, and we need the C matrix. So this is the A matrix, this is the B matrix, and this is the C matrix. So now we want to fill out this matrix. So we are going to use these two equations. These two equations we've already, we have the three equations, sorry, we have. So we know that x1, k plus one. So this is x1, k plus one is equal to x2. So this is the x2. So there's no contribution of x1. So here is zero. Then there's a contribution of x2. So here is one. Then for you, there's no, there's no u in this question. So the contribution of u is zero. Now, once x2, k plus 1, so we are now using the second equation now. So from this equation, there's no contribution. Okay, the contribution of x1 is minus 1. So there will be a minus 1 here. The contribution of x2 is 2. So there will be a 2 here. Then the contribution of u is 0 0.00125. So it's going to be 0 0.0125 here. Then for the, for the output y, so you have a contribution of x2 and you have a contribution of x1. So there's going to be a 1 here and a 1 here. So we have been we have successful now in converting the system from the we have been successful in converting the transfer function from the transfer function domain into the z domain. So let me just go over it once more. Let me go over it once more. So when you get to this step, here you are in the z domain. From this step, you just convert it into the, into the time domain. That's what you're going to do. So it's pretty much easy. So because of there's a z here, here is going to be k plus one. There's a z here, so here is going to be k plus one. So where there is no z, it's just kt. There's no, it's k plus zero, and k plus zero is equal to k. So you just have it here. Then after that, the next step is to represent it in state space form. And this is state space representation in the discrete time domain. So you have the notion of next state. So sk plus 1t is equal to ax plus bu, then y of k is equal to cx. Now we need to break it down into, because this is, these are matrices. This is a matrix because we have two states. So sk plus 1 is actually a matrix. It has x1 and x2. So this xk of t is also a matrix. It has x1 and x2. And this is a scalar and this is a matrix. So what I'm doing in this step is just simply this, this equation, these two equations, and this one is just the same thing. It's just now I'm expressing it in matrix form because this is a matrix, this is a matrix, and this is a matrix. So I'm writing it down here. So my aim is to find the A, B, and C matrix. That's my aim. And in order to do that, we're using these three equations we arrived at after converting it to the time domain. So for this x1, this is the first one, x1. This is the first one, x1. 
So he said x1 is x1 k plus 1 is, is equal to x2. So there's no contribution of, it's just x2. So the contribution of x1 is 0. The contribution of x2 is 1 because there's an x2. And there's no u. There's no plus u something. So you have a 0 here. Then for this, for this x2, now we are on the second line now. For this one, the contribution of x1 is minus 1 because of this minus here. So you have a minus 1 here. The contribution of x2 is 2. Then the contribution of u is this. So we're simply going to put 0 0.00125. 0 then for the output, you have x2 and x1. So the contribution of x1 is 1 and the contribution of x2 is 1. So we have been able to convert the system from the time domain into the, are the equations used to find the matrix of always constant? Yes. The equations that are used to find the matrix is always constant. So in state space, in state space, this is the representation in state space in discrete time. So x k plus 1 is equal to a x plus b y is equal to c x. In this question, we have two states. So therefore, that's why we broke it down into uh, x1 and x2. So this is the this equation, this is for continuous time, which would have you would have got your forward to. Then this is in discrete time. So because uh, because we have two states, because we have two states, that's why you have um, uh, x1 and x2. So they are always constant. They are always constant. So S K plus one. So this equation is a standard representation. So because in this question we have two states, so you represent this in matrix form as X one and X two. Then you represent this in state space form as X one and X two. If to say we had three states, if the question was three states, then that means that. The only thing that will change, this is always constant. This two is always constant. But if you have three states, the only thing that is going to change is that your SK of one is going to be, uh, it's going to have three, uh, it's going to have three, it's going to have X1, X2, and X3. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to post it on Modo. I'm going to post it on Modo. So you are going to, uh, to see. Then we are going to continue the class next week because I have less than a minute more.